Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here today, not just because of the obvious, um, to be amongst the many professional friends I can see seated before me, but uh, not just because of the fabulous Sydney, um, who has shown herself in the most remarkably beautiful light in the last few days, but uh, I'm delighted to be here to escape from the cold and gray of Britain. So there you are. Of course, the cold and the gray of Britain just slightly changes the texture of a cricket or rugby ball to our advantage. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's an issue of moisture content, you see, uh, but speak to me about that later. Now, I'm really pleased to be here because uh, it allows me to join in a great celebration uh, alongside so many others uh, to wish our historical maritime partner uh, a very happy 100th anniversary for the Australian Navy's arrival in Sydney. And I, stay, I say a historical partner for another reason, uh, which some people may have forgotten, because although, of course, that independent act 100 years ago was uh, very well and quite properly celebrated, it's that the Royal Australian Navy sailed the world under the white ensign until as late as 1967, under one flag. Uh, we're still proud of that. That's part of our connection. Uh, more than that still, I'm delighted because this is the opportunity um, and this is the conference uh, amongst other events of the week that provides for all of the navies to come together to share perspectives and to do good business. In fact, this conference, Pacific 2013, International Fleet Review, and all of the bilateral engagements that have been going on in the margin, some of which you'll have no visibility of, are living, breathing examples of defense engagement in action. And that's my subject uh, for now, for today, because I've been invited to, to give you my personal take on the UK's defense engagement. Uh, though I'm sure many of the themes that I will cover will really directly resonate with you. Um, what I have to say, I think, has an enduring flavor. Now, from my perspective, it's really timely uh, and helpful that I've been asked to talk about UK defense engagement and the Navy's approach to it. Why? Because, as has been hinted, the work to prepare the ground for the intellectual basis of this activity uh, has started already in the UK. And this year, on the 7th of February, the UK government published its, quote, International Defense Engagement Strategy. And this, in turn, has helped to give life to the UK's overarching strategy paper called Building Security Overseas produced a year after our 2010 Strategic Defense Review. This engagement business, very distinctive to us navies, is very much the heart of UK strategic thinking. Of course, this is governmental business. It's the reflection of the living, breathing character, the strategic ambition of a government. You could argue that it only lasts and lives as long as a government. But a government that sits within a proper strategic context and exerts some intellectual strategic ambition should lay down a groundwork which is common to consecutive governments. Our Foreign Secretary, William Hague, just a month ago reminded us, I felt he was talking to me and the Navy that I had privilege to run, Britain must have a global internationalist outlook. And it is in the interest of Britain to be fully engaged in the world affairs. And it doesn't stop there. In a recent call I made on the Prime Minister, my Prime Minister, he specifically asked me about UK defense engagement through the maritime. These are all very helpful questions, and it means that international defense engagement is up front and center. So what is our international defense engagement strategy? Well, in broad terms, it shapes the approach over the next 20 years. It's about using defense assets more specifically and more strategically to do better for UK influence, security, and prosperity, in an, all happening in an area of significant uh, uncertainty and change, all happening in a period where contingency is relevant. That's the strategic context. That's the UK defense position, 
but for the Royal Navy, what does it mean in practice? The first point I would make is this. There's no great whiff of revolution in the air here, at least not from a naval perspective. Defense engagements was already one of the three core roles performed by the Royal Navy, if you have the time to read about it, to protect and promote the nation's interests along with maritime security and war fighting. In fact, defense engagement has been a long-standing and customary task for the Royal Navy. It's part of our story. It's part of our history. It's part of our reputation. Actually, it's part of our being. So the name may have changed, but the substance remains essentially the same. Yet, something is new. What is that? Because there's now, under the new construct, a better integrated approach an integrated approach across defense. And defense is part of an integrated approach across the UK government. It's getting joined up. That is why the strategy was jointly published by both our foreign secretary and our defense secretary. That is why its governance board has representatives from all the relevant UK government departments. And that is why our National Security Council feeds into it through its connections. So what is new is that we now have a fully-fledged partnership in the delivery of defense engagement. And that partnership is good because it breeds understanding, because it generates focus, and because it delivers coordination. And that makes political and professional sense. In simple terms, as the strategy itself says, Defense engagement covers all of our activity short of combat operations. A pretty wide spectrum. And today I wanted to give you a sense by touching on four ways in which we deliver that engagement, the spectrum. First, it's about high-level international engagement. It's about building the maritime component in international partnerships and alliances. These may be multilateral. Take the 27-nation coalition that operates in the Indian Ocean as part of the Coalition Maritime Force, or the Royal Navy's involvement in the five-power defense arrangement, to name but two. And HMS Daring, here for the quiet, understated International Fleet Review, will be exercising with other FPDA units during her current deployment in the region. These partnerships may also be bilateral. Take, for example, the UK-Australian Defence Cooperation Treaty, signed in Perth on the 18th of January. And in the last two years, we, the UK, have also signed defence cooperation and defence technical arrangements with other countries in this region, Japan, India, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And you will all have your own multilateral relationships, like the Association the Southeast Asian nations, and bilateral partnerships like the Indian and Australian Strategic Cooperation Accord signed in Perth earlier this year. That's the high-level international engagement piece, and I think we can take that as a core element of the four parts. Second, it's about the smartest possible use of our ships for engagement effects at sea and ashore. For us, our Maritime Commitments Strategic Steering Group, the MCSSG, guides this on behalf of the Foreign Office and Defense to deliver the maximum effect from expensive assets. The interesting thing about a steering group like that, just a name to you, is it is a transfer of responsibility from the Navy's view of what it should be doing back into a defense construct. So our ships multitask. For example, we program our South Atlantic patrol ship to also assist with maritime security operations around the Gulf of Guinea. And I have my good friend, the chief of the Nigerian Navy, to give me a nod. And that, help, that helps in turn to underwrite security within that specific geographic area, which of course is connected to European, if not world, security and prosperity. 
or we could, be find, we could find ourselves operating around the choke points in the Persian Gulf as we do, reassuring markets, helping the world to feel and feed and fuel itself, preventing the arteries of global trade from hardening. And it means that we look at how deployed ships might contribute to UK government growth and prosperity agendas by exporting UK defense technology around the world. And right now, this morning, HMS Daring is doing just that. Parked alongside, crawling with contractors and interested bystanders, she is acting as a living, breathing example of British technological success. As a worthy platform, not just for defense sales of whole ships, not just for systems, but for subsystems and subcontractors and the complex integrated nature of the defense industrial matrix. Third of the four ways that defense engagement works for us is about training with our international partners. Let's start simple. At Britannia Royal Naval College, Dartmouth, we train officers from across the globe alongside our own. And this has enduring benefits. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, as of today, 20 chiefs of Navy around the world have been trained at Dartmouth, all soaked in a common ethos which now permeates relationships at the highest level. And just down the road from Dartmouth, Flag Officer Sea Training welcomes navies from around the world into Plymouth. We've all enjoyed their welcome. Last year, 19 different navies trained at FOST, reinforcing FOST as a global brand. And by training other nations, we help to train ourselves and maintain the standards that you expect of us. I could give you many more examples, but my point is this. This training together helps to build our cooperation, our interoperability, our brotherhood of the sea. And I regard that as the key enabler when we come to operate together. When a crisis hits, when a crisis hits, we have a common understanding of partners and structures. We don't waste valuable time getting to know each other. Fourth and last, it's about routine and regular staff level engagement. We have a formal program of bilateral staff talks with the navies of 26 different nations from every continent on the planet building shared understanding, building mutual trust, building common agendas. I could actually add a fifth if I was feeling mischievous, and I am. A fifth form of defense engagement could be something rather obscure. Let's call it the build and see approach, a sort of, as Prof Professor Holmes would say, a dry fleet review. In June next year, we will launch uh, the Queen Elizabeth, 65,000 tons of British um, strategic intent. And we have the Type 45 parked in Sydney. The global combat ship is coming. Uh, the new SSN, the Astute class, has achieved significant professional acclaim whilst rubbing shoulders with our American friends, which is important because that's a pretty important comparator to us. Every aircraft in the Royal Navy's fleet air arm is being replaced. The F-35B is coming our way. All of that equipment is coming as a statement of build, investment, defense industrial ambition, part of the strategic intent of the nation, not, not the product some no-hope Northwest European country in decline, I would suggest. But it is a form of indirect defense engagement because it's a statement of intent and it actually has a defense industrial relationship which percolates individual relationships. So the product of those four or maybe five elements produces our contribution defense engagement. And beyond all of that, the Royal Navy supports UK activity across the full arc of security, prosperity, and diplomatic business. And that's what we and most navies do. 
But defence engagement, as I said earlier, is uh, clear from the name, um, is an activity that applies to all three of our armed forces. And as part of the integrated approach in the UK's national strategy, we can join together as a defence effort to do just that. The delivery of training in Libya, for example, is a good current issue. And I'm a, an ad advocate of this joint approach, not just because my own professional career path has luckily enough taken me through a number of doors and opportunities that's made me see the totality of defence, but because if you don't approach maritime business through a defence lens, you can become isolated and self-interested. So maritime forces, which may or may not include, but should include the effort from Army and Air Force elements, do have certain unique selling points in delivering effective defense engagement. Let me just go through those briefly. In the area of contingency, our maritime forces are an engaged force. What does that mean? Well, that means that they are four deployed around the globe. It is a matter of considerable interest to me that I could not conduct a fleet defense review as we have seen. I simply would not be able to muster the ships in one location without completely unpacking the entire strategic investment of the Royal Navy around the world. I mean, I could do it, but I'd have to stop everything else. And our ships are four deployed. We have 14 units in the Gulf at the moment. This four deployed, this engaged force, is something of a return to the old ways. Last year, there were ship visits. It's a dangerous word, visit but there were engagements with 90 different countries. And in terms of defense engagement, real advantage flows from this. Why? Because properly led and used, it means that our maritime forces have great situational awareness, great partnership development. This comes through, of course, through a more persistent presence, through information gathering and sharing, through building a rapport at a personal level through relationships. So we become more culturally aware, less of a shallow interpreter of matters, less of a fly-by-night navy, going back again and again. As one of the commentator once said, First Sea Lord, you may have been in the Gulf for 30 years, or are you sure you haven't been there once 30 times? And within, with a range of movement, of 400 miles a day, our maritime forces, of course, deliver a large regional footprint of influence, but without having to commit to a footprint ashore. And the forces also provide value for money. And that's an important part of the persuasive language I use within the UK for our interpretation of defense engagement. Because forces from the maritime that are already in area and can flex between roles show great value for money. Take, for example, the UK's 2013 deployment of our task group called Cougar. This year, it's a long way from the UK, east of the Suez and into the Gulf. But it's not a long way from the UK's strategic interests. It's in area. It's taking its opportunity to engage with 20 different countries over the course of 13 different exercises and 24 planned port visits. It's elastic, so we can flex from one core role to another, from defense engagement, perhaps as far as contingent war fighting, if required. As the UK task group found itself in 2011, it's precisely what can happen. One moment you're conducting defense engagement, the next moment you find yourself in action off the coast of Libya. And our maritime forces also provide value for money because they come with a light touch, with a potential to operate independently, not dependent on host nations, access, or overflight. Please may we use your runway. Please may we use your airspace. Please may we use your harbor. Not necessarily with the maritime. So our maritime forces, as an engaged force, provide the UK with what I would call sea choice options in the delivery of defense engagement or in other core roles at low marginal cost. In, in this room, very many of you will recognize that these unique selling points apply to your own navies. Many are universal truths for all navies. The 
question is, how efficient can you make it? So, in closing, uh, what thoughts would I like to leave you with? Uh, it's this. Defense engagement is nothing new to us or you. Uh, but what is different is the emphasis, the emphasis on an integrated approach, a joined up approach, a partnering approach, one where we push really hard through strategic analysis for value for money. And that's why, at the bottom line, we value our relationships with so many of you in this room, whether they're relationships in this region or elsewhere in the world. And that is why, as many of you know, we want to strengthen our partnerships with you. And that is why, as I said at the beginning, I'm very lucky to be here. Thank you very much.